Halo Reach is a game that has changed my life. From the golden era of gaming in the Xbox 360, Halo Reach was one of the first games I would stay up till 7 in the morning for on a school night and just game and make friends that I still talk to to this day. And for this video, I want to talk about its campaign. Also Nathaniel, who has commented on every video, it's happening. You could rest now. Well, rest until the next Reach video. No further ado, let's just hop right into it. After the release of the third installment, Halo had become the most popular video game franchise in the world. Bungie going three for three like the Chicago Bulls in the 90s had the studio revered as the gift that kept on giving for Microsoft. But they were also looking for an exit plan from the thing that they were most known for, and what pretty much made the studio what it is today. Because sadly, Nop and Marathon weren't the games that made the shadow people at Microsoft multi-millionaires. Surprising, I know. In 2007, shortly after Halo 3 succeeded, Success, Bungie was split apart from Microsoft, becoming its own company. They were still making their last two contracted games, but now under the independent collaborative Bungie, not Microsoft's Bungie. They would then split up its team, with around 70 people working on a Halo 3 expansion titled Halo 3 Recon, soon to be ODST. Sold as a full-priced game by Microsoft due to them feeling finessed, not wanting to sell it for cheaper because this was at the time where Microsoft was being ran by Mr. Eugene Krabs. Now they're ran by that one smiling friend CEO with the chicken nuggets. It's my IP to sit on and do nothing with. Microsoft felt slighted because Bungie was using an expansion to finish one game on their contract, while the rest of the staff worked on their other original contracted game. So with the launch of Halo 3 ODST in 2009 was also the beta to Bungie's new coming title, Halo Reach, as well as an Easter egg announcement stating Destiny awaits. Coming soon will be the 10th anniversary of Destiny, but in 2009, which was 15 years ago, this was the first ever mention of it. But, as I said earlier, Halo Reach was a contract obligation with Microsoft, and Bungie's leads were burnt out after the massive crunch that was Halo 2, as well as the smaller but still crunch that was Halo 3. So yeah, after getting whipped and forced to sleep in the offices, Bungie did not want to make Halo games anymore, no matter how successful they were, and were already on rocky waters with Microsoft after Halo 3 ODST. So wanting to make Destiny, Bungie tackled Halo Reach in a way that would make the game still feel authentic to the Halo brand, while also testing the creative limits of the studio. Halo 3 was a game that didn't do anything too risky to piss people off. It took what was good about Halo 2 and CE and perfected them to the best of its ability, and the foundations of what made Halo enjoyable. It's why Halo 3 is so many people's favorite Halo game. If this was going to be their last Halo game ever, they were going to make a game that was going to both set up their future and be one last hurrah. So Halo Reach became the first ever test dummy to what eventually become Destiny. At first, this would sound like a bad idea to turn a Halo game into a crash dummy, but it was actually the opposite. Instead of making a safe sequel to Halo 3 with more polygons and better graphics, they didn't make Halo 4, and instead took on a challenge to make something they'd never made before. Ditching the safe anchor, the Master Chief, and the Halo identity that Bungie gained over the last three hit games, and instead went out of their comfort zone, tackling a real creative challenge that Bungie hasn't had to face since combat evolved. They made a prequel deviating from what made the studio iconic, right before making an original IP. The Blam engine was reinvented from the ground up where a lot of the principles and tactics would eventually get used within the Tiger engine that was made for Destiny, and the game loop of Halo once again evolved. Halo Reach is a controversial title for this. It was on paper the first Halo game that changed the Halo format in a way that made some uncomfortable. But where some say Reach changing was for the worse, I see it as for the better. It has a lot of game choices that make it more enjoyable to me, even more than a game like 3. And in comparison to games like 4, 5, or Infinite, Reach was the most confident in its changes, with the best quality, and could as well have been the catalyst for 343 chasing the tales of giants that could never live up to, feeling the pressure to always evolve like Bungie did for the last game, but never quite nailing it down. In the start, the first piece of controversy for Halo Reach was its existence. The Fall of Reach was a book that came out on October 30th, 2001, about a month and a quarter before the release of Halo Combat Evolved to explain the game's introduction. The book was ordered to be created by Microsoft and was written by Eric Nyland, going over Bungie's head following the lore bible of Combat Evolved. Halo Reach 2010 is Bungie's version of The Fall of Reach, and retcons the book written by Microsoft, and that pissed off a lot of people. The Fall of Reach is enjoyed by many in the old Halo fandom. It's a good standalone book and made many not happy with Halo Reach's adapt but let's be honest, most people who played Halo Reach were idiots like me in front of the TV at 8 years old, or a dad who got home from work, cracked open a Guinness, and played Invasion. A book has a lot of benefits that a game doesn't. It can expand a world and its characters heavily, over many, many hours straight from the thoughts of characters' minds directly. Where in a game like Halo Reach, having the characters speak plain would be jarring and unnatural. So you have to use the medium of show, don't tell. This is a problem with all visual mediums. A movie like Dune has to get creative in its presentation to make you understand its world. Whereas when you read the book, you get a more descriptive detail 
detail in writing of a setting or the thought processes of characters, at the cost of having to use your imagination to interpret the text. I like the Fall of Reach as a standalone book, getting the origins of the Master Chief and how he killed an ODST, which makes me sad now because I like ODSTs, but I've always been turned off by outside media having to coexist with in-house media to understand said in-house media. End of the day, Master Chief is a stoic that is really cool and saves the world and is seen as space Jesus to everyone, giving hope and happiness. But you don't need to know he used to play with worms and has a gluten intolerance. You can find that in a book, okay? That's why they exist. So is it really fair to limit Bungie, who didn't even have a say in the original Fall of Reach novel, to now limit their telling of the Fall of Reach and their original game universe? All for a book that 95% of the general fan base didn't read. Like how the Halo shows now tackle the Fall of Reach, the best way to go about these mediums is to see all three things as their own interpretations and taken as it is. Because at the end of the day, the planet falls and Master Chief takes over, all drains lead to the ocean. So with all that being said, I love the direction of how Halo Reach is actually displayed from Bungie's vision in its campaign. A drastic change in Halo Reach is the existence of Spartan 3s. Spartan 3s are not Spartan 2s like the Master Chief or the Spartans before him with Mark IV Harmor. They're instead a more cheaper, disposable line of Spartan, with the core difference being that they have more humanity in comparison to a Spartan 2. Similar to the dynamics of ODSTs, Spartan 3s benefit heavily from cooperation, which is where you come in, being the third big change to Halo Reach. As a Spartan, you're not the Master Chief, instead you're the sixth member of Noble Team, which is your new squad. Noble Six is a character I've always had a deep love for in Halo. As a kid, I thought he was cool and heroic, but playing him again for this video in this position of life I'm in has made me appreciate the character way more. At a glance, Noble Six seems like another self-insert for a main character, like you see from any other game, but Noble Six is vague enough to still be a vessel for the player, while also still being unique enough to be his own independent person. This isn't me as a random Spartan or the rookie ODST. This is me as Noble Six. Like the Master Chief, Noble Six is a capable lethal weapon that could be efficient when alone, but unlike like the Master Chief, Noble Six isn't so strong that he could take out Scarabs single-handedly and give the Covenant back their bomb. Also, Noble Six is nobody, and I just said that we're Noble Six, so I guess we're nobody as well. From the start of the game until Reach Falls, a feeling of dread and unimportance lingers around you. Noble Six in the start is unimportant, and by the end, when you put the controller down and stop playing as him, he's also forgotten. After seeing the predetermined outcome at the start of the game with your cracked helmet and the future overgrown reach, you then start at the beginning when you first leave your warthog and quickly this feeling of uneasiness lurks. You're the new guy that no one knows anything about. Even as a player, you don't know anything about yourself. You're a ghost replacement for someone that once had chemistry with Noble Team, but this isn't unique. And this is because everyone besides Noble 1 and Noble 2 have also replaced fallen members of Noble Team. Addressed by your commander, he introduces you to your new team, seeing you as the last piece that makes Noble up to full strength. You're given a quick rundown of your squad mates as they head out the door without even addressing you. Still, Commander Carter eases you into being a team player, tearing you away from your past, now to be a part of something new. Something better. Colonel, this is Noble One. The Covenant are on reach. The greatest thing Halo Reach does is display hope as this dwindling candle flame from mission to mission throughout the course of its campaign. A subversion to Halo 3 where the tagline for all the marketing was, believe. The concept of a Spartan itself is to represent hope. Spartans never die, they just go missing in action. This is constantly echoed throughout the Halo games. But this hope is not in Reach. The tagline for this game's marketing wasn't believe, but rather remember reach. It's another reason why I prefer Noble Six to the Master Chief. There's something cool about the chosen savior of humanity trope, but maybe I'm just more of a sad person now as I get older, or I just really like seeing the realism of things not going the way you want to, and stuff just not meeting your expectations. And having a guy fueled by hopeless adversity that's just trying his best while being more human is just really compelling to me. Can you tell I played Red Dead recently? Halo 3 ODST had this feeling displayed in its tone and surroundings when you played as the rookie. It was somber and dark, but in game, you still find your friends all being alive at that, ending the game on a positive note. But there is nothing uplifting in Halo Reach. The lone wolf is thrown into an unwanted conflict where he plays a rigged game he's unaware of, and little by little the daunting truth that he's playing this rigged game becomes more apparent the harder he tries to fight against it. Unlike any other of the Halo games, Reach is the most serious in its tone, relying on world building as its sole source for storytelling. The Covenant are not whimsical or funny in any interaction like how they were displayed in previous games. Here they are brutal and intimidating. 
torturing soldiers, killing civilians, killing Spartans, not just random Spartans, some are even your own squad mates, all while still being intelligent, ruthless, and mysterious. They don't speak English and instead speak in their own unique language to each other, feeling truly foreign, being even more disconnected from humanity. You don't learn about their purpose like Halo 2 or get the perspective from the other side. All you see is the aftermath of their actions from the perspective of a soldier. Even with Noble Team, the UNSC, Oni, your perspective is just as vague. Noble Team is developed by the world around them, not by your progression with them. You ain't going on fishing trips and hunting to learn about Cat and Emil. You're just the fly on the wall in a conflict larger than yourself. And within the team, you're still just the new guy. So until the ending, you answer to Carter, who answers to the higher chain of command, either it be Oni defenses or simple UNSC missions. And even then, he's still in the dark sometimes. Reach uses its levels to flesh out your teammates as you progress through the Battle of Reach. You will fight with specific members and missions that make the most sense to their unique skill. And through these missions, you get to learn about the personalities of whatever member you're hanging out with. The first mission you play, where you don't even know that the Covenant are on Reach yet, you're on the ground with your squad looking at trash, trying to see what's going on while your marksman is in the sky avoiding ground conflict. And the thing that stuck out to me fast was George's interactions with the locals. The heavy gunner, who was once a Spartan too, surprisingly had the most humanity on the squad. And as the game kept going, with the little time Reach had, they sold every character's personality to me. One of the best cutscenes is also around the start of the game. It's the Engage one that's split into two parts, that one cutscene that has the awesome-ass camera movement from a first-person perspective where you punch an elite in the face. The entire cutscene displays the personalities of each Noble Team member. Cat is focused but lacks hindsight, George is emotional but delusional, Emil is prideful, and Carter is a great leader that cares for a squad. And you, Noble Six, are the Lone Wolf. And the way these traits are fleshed out is by interactions displayed through the camera and throughout the missions. The world building of Reach also applies to Noble Team. You're not told the origins of of each member are what made them stand out to get assigned. You're instead shown why they are on the team. The uniqueness of Noble Team is displayed visually, from their armor to how they move to how they speak, you see it all. And this humanity of Noble Team is also used to help display Reach's narrative of fading hope. Slip space rupture detected. Are you reading this? Slip space Multiple covenant detected. signals. Slip space Someone coming detected. in the lead. Slip space yeah, rupture yeah, detected. Yeah, yeah. At first, Halo Reach could seem traditional. A group of heroes doing things to save their home, then Reach decides to pull that rug from under you, undermining every action you do. At first, the planet Reach is green and beautiful, full of clear skies and wildlife, and shortly after finding out that the Covenant are on Reach, you go to Sword Base. I point this mission out specifically because you play on Sword Base twice, once at the start of the campaign and then again at the end. And the visual difference from just the environment alone shows you the toll of the war and who is winning. Reach is visually rotting throughout your playthrough, chipping away and away as you are still holding on to hope of saving her. Every way you contribute is just wasting time, fighting a fire with nothing but a sand bucket, pushing back against the inevitable. You enter a battle after a scouting mission thinking that you have the upper hand and you fight your way to a communication spire to then blow up the spire thinking you made an impact. Just have everything be undone in a blink of an eye, sending you five steps back from where you just were, which was already five steps back. Doomed and waiting for backup, Noble Team still clings on to hope. With this hope, you do a whole scheme, fight to space, fight in space, and after all this fighting, now is the chance to save everyone by blowing up the Covenant Mothership. Requiring a sacrifice to detonate manually, the one with the most humanity on the squad kills himself to protect his home. But, like I said earlier, George has a lot of humanity, but is also delusional. This is not only displayed in his interaction with Emil, but also with Halsey, thinking Oni cares about anyone but themselves. Even the rest of the Noble Team knows that Oni doesn't give a shit about them. So, sacrificing himself to save Reach meant nothing, because it was undermined in an instant. A whole fleet of the same mothership you just fought to blow up replaces it instantly, sending you back 15 steps from where you just were, which was already 10 steps back. George died for nothing. Landing back on Reach, Noble Six is in the aftermath of this invasion. Fighting in the results of this pointless sacrifice, you still hold on to hope, fighting to save the innocent people of New Alexandria. First hand, you get to bask in the brutality of the Covenant, slaughtering both civilians and soldiers alike. You rescue those you can and watch the city continue to burn and fall. You're doing nothing, and that hope you had is fading more and more. You're making no impact on this war, yet you keep fighting, and you keep fighting until you regroup with Noble Team. You address George's sacrifice and brainstorm what to do next. Well, Cat brainstorms what to do next. Everyone else doesn't even know if there's anything to fight for anymore. So far in the story, Cat has been the sole person holding on to hope. She sketched out the plan for George's sacrifice by using classified Oni data she stole earlier in the game. And right now she's tapping into higher comms to discover that Spartans are now being told to stop fighting and instead take a defensive stance for evacuation, except for Noble Team. While being smart and cunning, like I said, Cat is also oblivious and lacks hindsight. She's still scheming up plans and strategies holding on to this hope when the war is already lost. And you have now been sent on a new mission.
Cat's death was the most shocking and impactful to me in the game, because in comparison to everyone else, it was the most realistic. She didn't die on a last stand or heroic sacrifice like the others. She died mid-conversation, mid-strategy, abruptly because of human error. She died because she was scared and distracted on getting everyone to safety while disagreeing with higher up commands while still thinking of a new plan and she got caught off guard. You even saw this earlier when a combo of distraction and fear made her miss the button on your guys' elevator, which was a mistake that made both her and you lag behind everyone else. Because as I said earlier, Kat's weakness is hindsight and distraction. That focus without awareness got her caught by Halsey. This focus without awareness is how she lost her arm in the promotional trailer, and here it's what got her killed. The death of Cat also marks the turning point of Reach. Hope dies with Cat. The person who had a plan and was holding on to faith dies while also accomplishing nothing. Carter holds her body as you look at the same new Alexandra you fought so hard to defend, on both land and sky, collapsing and on fire. And as you heard earlier from the radio in the elevator conversation, there are no more trick cards or hidden plans up your sleeve. It's over. You lost Reach. And now the plan is to get the people who are still alive off of it. Heading to Sword Base, the game feels different. You are no longer fighting to make an impact or change the war, but instead just surviving to complete a mission you know nothing about. Fighting through a same location that is now thrashed and overrun, like I said earlier. Visually, you could see the war's toll on reach. The skybox, the environments. It's horrible. Then getting where you need to be, you see soldiers dead, where you get the two different perspectives of Carter and June. We'll talk about this later, but it's a nice and subtle example of how they both see situations. After fighting and much skepticism of what you're doing, it's revealed that the team has been misdirected. The mission is not a torch and burn off where you blow up sword base. It's not even a standard UNSC mission. It's something entirely new. I've been going on about how Halo Reach is hopeless and depressing, and yeah, the game up to this point is pretty miserable. But still, Halo is a franchise about hope. And Reach is no different, even though it might not feel this way on the surface, Halo Reach's hope is just delivered in a different package. The hope of Halo Reach was never going to be from saving Reach itself. We behind the screen already knew that it was going to fall, and at some point Noble Team knows this as well. But hope in this game comes in a different way, not from saving Reach, but rather saving the people who can then save everyone later. In the dark still, Carter is told by Halsey the importance of what they have been called for. And after defending Halsey, you are shown what this new hope is. No one's death was for nothing, even Cat's stolen data from earlier has helped contribute. You all all were chosen for something greater, to help all of humanity by putting your last bit of hope and getting this tool to the guy who could save everyone. And then after all that, Cortana chooses you, Noble Six, to specifically deliver her. So now you have an attainable goal to fight for again. You need to get off reach with this package, and Noble Team needs to help you get there no matter the cost. June doesn't assist Noble on the suicide mission. Being the most evasive and cold of the group, he's sent to make sure Halsey doesn't get into enemy hands. Not get to safety like the package, but not get into enemy hands. The road to the Pillar of Autumn is brutal, with only three Noble Team members left, Carter is injured and near death, making himself a distraction as you take the rest of the journey on foot. With the Scarab in the way of you and Emil, the journey once again feels hopeless. You're not the Master Chief. You're not going to single-handedly take down the Scarab. So Carter sacrifices himself to save his squad, like the good leader he is, re-sparking that hope again. You and Emil then fight your way to the landing pad. Now at the retrieval point, Emil sacrifices his life offering to stay on reach by taking the turret to kill all Covenant flying vehicles that could interfere with the package pickup. He will die with the planet to make sure you get to safety. Almost at the hands of victory, the hands of safety, the zealot that has stalked you the whole game, the one from the start, the one that killed Cat, is now here for a final strike. A surprise attack on Emil has him striking down the zealot. After winning and getting boastful, Emil is then surprise attacked. And as prideful as he is, he takes that same zealot to the grave with him, dying for a cause, dying to save you and everyone else. Now with no one to man that gun, you give Admiral Keys the package and pay it forward. Staying on reach, giving up your salvation, also everyone could have a chance, so everyone could later have hope. And with the sacrifice, it's over. You're left behind with all the other Spartans dying for the same cause. No trick cards, no salvation. You did your job and you still don't get peace. Fight till your last breath, and die like how you started this journey, alone. The hope of Reach is showing this to you. It's not just the reality of being a Spartan, but the reality of being a hero. 
a good person, a truly selfless person. Each member of Noble Team fell into situations of valor. None were cowards or people looking out for their best interest. If June had to jump on a grenade, he would, as well, to save everyone. That's the humanity of Spartan 3s. These are characters who do nothing and lose and fight through adversity to not win, but give someone else a chance to. And when they have the opportunity to go out loud, it's not to save the day, but rather fail with honor and purpose. Noble Six is not important, he's not memorable, and he has no legacy. But even without the light shining on him, he still did what needed to be done. Noble Team tried. They tried their best, knowing there was no light at the end of the tunnel, but rather hope on the other side of it. And that's why Reach is my favorite Halo campaign. Because to me, it's a true display of hope. Contact with Visegrad Relay was lost last night. I responded with trooper fire teams, which have since been declared MIA. And now you're sending us. That's Cat, Noble 2, Neil and George 4 and 5. Neighbors were attacked last night. He heard screams, gunfire, stopped around sunrise, says something in the fields killed his son. Commander, be advised, I'm reading heat signatures in that structure directly east of your position. Barely getting you. What's your situation? Over. Colonel, this is Noble One. The Covenant are on reach. Come again, Noble One. Did you say Covenant? Can't be. Not on reach. As per the winter contingency, we are countering on every I know we're losing. I want to know if we've lost. We will make it sooner or later. Reach has been good to me. Time has come to return the favor. Slip space rupture detected. Are you reading this? Slip space rupture detected. Slip space rupture detected. Repeat, Nova 2, Noble 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 